Um, my name is Marty Kelsey. I'm one of the hosts of STEM in 30. STEM in 30 is an Emmy-nominated TV show for students produced by the National Air and Space Museum. We have a new episode coming out later this week about Apollo and connecting it to Artemis. So be sure to go check that out. We have a great show for you today, um, and we want this to be your show. So please submit questions either in the chat or through the Q&A function of the webinar. We've got, um, you saw Barb and Kelsey earlier, they'll be monitoring that and send them, sending them in. So we definitely wanna get questions and bonus points if there are students watching and you can stump one of our experts today. We love it when that happens because students, one of the things I will tell you is that when you stump an expert, they don't like that. And they will go back later and look up that answer. And then I'll get an email the next day saying, you know what? I found the answer to that. So try to stump them today. We are joined by Andrew Mead McGee, Curator of Computing at the National Air and Space Museum, as well as Major Andrew Garaspi, Flight Commander, Mission Systems in the United States Space Force. Andrew and, and Major, thank you both for joining us today. We really appreciate it. All right, so I'm going to turn it over to Andrew Mead McGee, who is going to talk a little bit about the history of coding and the, with an emphasis on the Apollo program. So, Andrew, take it away. Thank you very much, Marty. Thank you for having me, and thank you to uh, other Andrew from the Space Force for joining us today, and thank you to all of the folks tuning in. Uh, what, for me, is just turning the afternoon here in Washington, D.C., I'm curator of computing at the National Air and Space Museum of the Smithsonian Institution, which means I'm a computer historian. I'm interested in how we got from the age of big clanking machines to the kinds of computers you have today that are in your pockets, your phones, on your watches, uh, in everyday devices, from your fridge to uh, in, embedded in your car. And the story of the Apollo missions and the last mission, Apollo 17, is one in which computing draws on a long history of man's desire to use machines to calculate things, but also transforms as a result of the specifics of the Apollo missions. And just to give you a little bit of sense of how things functioned in the 1960s and the 1970s when the Apollo missions are occurring, when the space race is happening and the United States and the Soviet Union are in a diplomatic and scientific and cultural standoff to send people to the moon first as a matter of national pride to show off that their systems are superior to their geopolitical rival systems. Computing plays a major role in this. We think about the space race, we think about rockets, maybe we think about atomic power, we think about physics, but undergirding all of this are the role of mainframe computers, these large centralized devices that run off of punch cards, pieces of paper that have instructions punched into them, holes that indicate pluses or minuses, yeses or nos, positives or negatives that become the basis of binary code. And out of this system of large scale room size computers that require teams of operators to encode information, to enter punch cards, to make sure that processes are running correctly, we managed to put multiple rockets into space and send man to the moon on multiple occasions as a result of our capability to harness computers to calculate complex equations. Computers then and now do three basic buckets of tasks. They calculate the natural world. They take interrelationships among numbers, variables that we as humans present them and they calculate them. And they do that at extraordinary speed and at large scale in a way that humans are not able to do without a great deal of time. Beyond calculating the natural world, computers organize information. They sort, they aggregate, they collate, they can store huge quantities of data and then recall them upon command. And then finally, computers can assist in communications. They can take 
transmissions and break them into small packets and use and be used to transmit those packets digitally so that they are reassembled on the other end. There are other things that computers can do that are tied in with these larger tasks. Some of you may be familiar with computers and code breaking and cryptography. Uh, computers can be used for recreation, they can be used for gaming, but everything that computers do fits in one of these three purposes. And when it comes to the uh, Apollo missions, and it comes to how we go about this complex process of sending humans into space, of putting people on the surface of the moon, computers are used for all three of those functions. Computers undergird the radio communication systems that are used to connect the spaceflight operations with ground control. Computers are at the heart of the consoles that oversee the guidance control and navigation systems by accumulating huge amounts of information and categorically sorting them. And then computers are used to calculate the all crucial equations of launch, trajectory, re-entry. They had a little bit of help though. It's not just computers on the ground, these giant mainframe computers in places like Virginia and Huntsville, Alabama and Houston, Texas that are guiding NASA throughout this process. There are computers actually installed on the Apollo command modules and the lunar modules. And I don't have any illustrations to show today, but I know we have some illustrations of the Apollo guidance computer, which is an electronic digital computer, a very small device that provided a basic interface by which the astronauts in the command module could navigate and control their spacecraft. And beginning in the late 1960s, these are the first true computers based on integrated circuits, what we think of as today's chips, as opposed to much larger vacuum tube based systems or much larger chip based systems. We can see here some images of the uh, Apollo guidance computer. Now, this is a very complex device for the late 1960s and early 1970s, but it's far less powerful than the phones many of you have within reach right now. It's a 16-bit computer. It stores 15 bits of information and then one control bit, a parity bit. It's a read-only memory. And what's particularly interesting in how the software is relayed in this read-only memory, if we could show a picture of the, uh, the core rope memory by chance. Uh, here we go. So this is a series of wires and fibers that are woven together. Imagine if you were you know, knitting a blanket, for instance around magnetic cores. This was done to make a more robust computer memory system that would survive the vicissitudes of a launch and re-entry and concerns about atmospheric radiation and high temperatures. That there, similar to a flash memory chip that you might insert in your phone or a memory drive you might plug into your computer, was woven by hand. Let's go back to the image. Uh, of the person weaving the core memory, if we could. Uh, previous image, there we go. That's what we uh, was jokingly called in the 1960s and 1970s, an LOL, a little old lady uh, who is hand weaving that memory that will store the commands that the astronauts input um, numerically. If we can go back to the image of the display keyboard, please. I think it was the preceding image. There we go. So we have what's called a DSKY, D -S -K -Y, which is just a, a control interface that uses a very simple assembly language. And this is much more primitive than many of the coding languages you may be familiar with today that will be talked about during the hour of the code and that you may encounter in your programs in your schools. These very basic languages 
uh, allow extremely simple commands to be directly carried out in terms of calculations. You can select the memory bank. You can, you know, add, uh, subtract. You can calculate things. You can do specific commands to facilitate the movement of the ship using combinations of keys, all of which are based on simple inputted commands that will yield direct results and which are stored in this core memory that you talked about. Yet to program something so simple takes an incredibly complex series of steps. Maybe we could show the photograph of Margaret Hamilton. Uh, here we have one of the leading software engineers associated with coding for the Apollo project, an example of the kind of printout of lines of code. Uh, this lady is perhaps slightly shorter than normal height, but you see stacked next to her the books of code required to send someone to the moon. Each of those lines of code typed and printed out and bound in a volume stacked on top of one another. If we think about the hundreds of thousands of lines of code required for this process. What we see that comes out of the Apollo project and the series of Apollo missions culminating in Apollo 17 that iteratively refine our understanding of how computers can be used on board spacecraft is in fact the emergence of a new field of software engineering. The Apollo guidance computer that you saw a photograph of requires a simple and reliable real-time system that both responds quickly and allows for human intervention in case of the most unlikely circumstances occurring. So the language that was developed by NASA and collaborators at MIT and their instrumentation laboratory is both simple and complex. And the field that emerges out of it, the direct descendants of which we see in today's coding practices, is this field of software engineering, which is a distinctly different approach to how we thought about coding and computers prior to the late 1960s and 1970s, in which engineering techniques of assessing and implementing flexible code, code that can pivot on the turn of a dime, is essential to understanding how you design a program from the ground up. So due to constraints of space, materials, and the capability of operators, astronauts who are in an enclosed space and are not trained as computer scientists. A computer system is developed for the Apollo program that allows on-the-fly programming and allows direct responsiveness from a series of base-level assembly language commands. What comes out of this, the efforts that go into to making something so complex approachable on the surface is this new way of understanding software engineering. And if we think about how we approach software today, how we think about nimbleness and flexibility when it comes to writing code, when we think about the ways we go about iteratively stacking and reviewing and reformulating code, much of that emerges from that moment. So modern software is not necessarily the direct descendant of the processes and methods and mindsets that went into the Apollo program designing of computer software, but it owes a great deal to the efforts to try to create a flexible space-saving computer system that could survive the rigors of space. And at what that time was arguably the most complex endeavor man had ever undertaken and had ever assigned to a computer. I look forward to any questions folks have, and I can get into particulars about the Apollo guidance computer, what coding was like in the 1960s and 1970s, and some of these transformations of how we got from then to now when it comes to computers. Thank you. Cool. And Andrew, we've got a couple of questions that are that are coming in. So I want to remind everybody 
please submit those questions um, either through the Q&A or in the chat and we will get to them. Um, so two real quickly, how long did it take to make the 16-bit computer? It took a very long time to actually design it. It took years of iterative work of coming up with how you would build the computer. In terms of actually building the computers and the interfaces, the diskies themselves, just a couple of months. But it's kind of like sitting with a blank piece of paper and figuring out how you create the light bulb. Then you can build the light bulb. Nice. And the other question that, that's come in for now, how long did it take to build a successful rocket with the old coding system and tools? Well, so the the rockets are themselves the process of a, many different kinds of engineering, aerodynamics, chemical engineering, electromechanical engineering, and the guidance systems that control them are being designed by one set of engineers, just as other engineers are working on how do you build the propellants and the fuels? How do you actually structure the rockets so they break away? How do you make them more aerodynamic? So the important thing to consider about the Apollo program and the space rockets in general is just how complex they are, multiple overlapping systems. So it's a little more complex than the group project where all four partners have their own piece that they have to bring together. Right. It's not like that science project where you're handed a bunch of bendy straws in 15 minutes. There you go. There you go. All right. Well, Andrew, thank you so much for that. Now let's turn it over um, to Major Andrew Garaspi, and he's going to talk about coding use in Space Force. So, Major, take it away. Hey, good morning. Uh, I am Major Andrew Garaspi. Um, Today, I want to talk to you about uh, coding in today and my experience in the U U.S. Air Force and the U.S. Space Force and how I've gotten to see in the U.S. military um, in, my, in my time um, coding applied across um, uh, the, the U.S. government and the U.S. military. So to start off with, who am I? I am a major uh, and I am currently in my current assignment, a mission systems flight commander out at Shine Mountain Space Force Station in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Uh, the Cheyenne Mountain is a top secret facility inside of a mountain and uh, we have very many communication systems that uh, have various levels of coding today um, and I lead the communication squadron piece inside of uh, the, the mountain. You may have heard of NORAD, which is a Northern Aerospace uh, Defense, and uh, we provide security across uh, Northern America, so both uh, the US and also Canada. So how did I get here today? Um, well, to start off with, I was just like all of you. I was in grade school. Um, I went up through high school, and I always had a passion for learning. And that's really the key here. Uh, if you, if you want to pursue um, um, a career in coding or, or any sort of uh, software development, um, or uh, and I will talk a little bit later on about how I think coding means a lot more than just software development today. Uh, I went to the US Air Force Academy where I studied uh, computer science, and that is uh, a broad range of different um, uh, coding applications. You can you can study uh, networks, uh, cybersecurity, operating systems, how a computer works, um, and uh, development. So making applications across many different languages and technologies to, to interface with different systems, just like uh, Andrew uh, McGee had just uh, had just talked about. Uh, after my time at the Academy, I, uh, I've had several assignments across the Space Force and the Air Force, and uh, one of which I have gotten my master's in software development at uh, AFIT, Air Force Institute of Technology. And uh, I've had opportunities to, to apply all these uh, skills that I have learned um, with, with coding uh, at, at various different assignments. I've, I've been a part of teams that uh, code applications for Squadron Officer School uh, down at Maxwell Air Force Base and also um, out at NATO um, in, the, in the Netherlands. And um, so what do I do today? Now I am a leader by, by day, but by night I am a, um, a super coder. And what that means is, is I am a full stack web developer for the United States Space Force. Um, what does that mean? That means uh, I develop applications using programming languages, coding, 
across different languages. So some examples would be like JavaScript, um, working with Docker as well as other um, uh, databases and, and, and working with. So what you see when you go to websites, how does a website work? There are many different systems and, and uh, abstractions uh, across um, that, what you see happening on that website. Um, and that is what I also specialize within, within the Space Force. So coding today, uh, I mentioned, I think coding is um, a very, it's, it's, it's been a, it's gone from what Andrew has described as sort of a command line um, uh, development to, to being abstracted, to be, be very accessible across many different um, uh, system layers. So whether or not you're, you're working for the military or the government in general, uh, you could also work for corporations and, and specialize in different aspects of, um, of coding. Uh, Andrew mentioned assembly language that's still applicable today. Computers at the, at the very lowest level have to, you have to code in assembly language to, to interface um, electrons, um, ones and zeros on and off switches at the, at the transistor level. Uh, and, and there's so many different layers of abstraction that nowadays you have um, entry level um, coding to, to, to make computer systems um, do what you want them to do. Um, for example, uh, my, my, um, I have my uh, two daughters um, working on uh, iPads and, and doing coding and, and games. So they've get, there's gamification across coding. Um, so um, what, what, what have I seen in my time uh, in the Air Force and Space Force? Um, well, uh, there, are, there are many opportunities to, to do coding. Um, this could be cybersecurity. So uh, working, whether that's working with um, serial interfaces or, or consoling into different systems and checking network health, applying um, uh, different security rules to, to network interfaces, or it could be um, what I do, software development, web, web um, application and web development, or you could be doing um, in the U.S. Space Force and Air Force uh, some emerging and new technologies. Uh, in my time, I've seen uh, artificial intelligence and data science as a, a huge uh, um, new front that the U.S. military is tackling, especially across uh, DoD uh, software factories. And uh, those are um, sort of centralized locations across uh, many different cities in the U.S. Colorado Springs has one. Uh, there's one out in Boston that's a big one called Kessel Run, and there's L.A. and Hawaii, um, where you have these DoD software factories that are um, tackling um, different software and, and coding challenges um, across the DoD and the military. And on the front of that, uh, we're using artificial intelligence to, um, to uh, answer tough problems. And at a very uh, high level, artificial intelligence is really just um, going from you telling what a computer to do to you telling the computer, how to tell the computer what to do, uh, sort of um, um, having a computer learn instead of you learning to, to control the computer. And that's um, a, a huge front for the U.S. military. Another piece uh, I see emerging uh, as, a, as a chance to, to what you could be working on in the future if you worked for the, for the government um, uh, coding is is um, virtual reality and augmented reality. That's, a, that's become a huge um, uh, challenge for the military. There are many applications within the military where people are using, uh, you see the headsets nowadays for, for mostly games, but sometimes uh, nowadays uh, people are, can, can use them to work from home for other applications. But in the future, you'll see much more uh, virtual reality headsets being used for uh, training um, across the military. Um, you almost see that now with operations as well within, um, I don't know if you've heard of the, the, the F-35 fighter plane, but the, um, there's an augmented reality type helmet that, that the pilots use um, uh, to, to sort of immerse themselves into the, the plane's technology as well as their, their actual reality. 
Um, so, um, I do not have, if, uh, I guess I'll take now uh, questions if, if there are any um, for applications of today in the, in the US government and, and for the military. Yeah, we've got a lot of questions coming in, but the first one I need to ask about, and somebody mentioned this in the, in the questions, Talked about NORAD, and the big thing for NORAD is the Santa tracker. Is that something that you can talk about, or is that too highly classified? That is pretty classified, but I can tell you that it is happening. Um, you can definitely call NORAD, and we're supporting to track Santa. His whereabouts is is highly highly top secret, but um, um, definitely uh, give give NORAD a call and uh, and ask about uh, the Santa tracker. That is awesome. Um, Okay, so what, let's start with a question that's come in. Can you kind of give us that, that overview of the work that Space Force does since it is so, such a new branch of the service? Of course, sorry, I left that off. So, so Space Force is a new branch of service. Uh, we stood up in 2019, then in 2019, and it is a branch that um, uh, we have developed since, the, since our, new, uh, since our um, immersion, but uh, a lot of what was being handled by the Air Force um, for the for the space mission. We are not astronauts, so that's a common misconception. That mission is still handled by NASA. There are some um, Space Force Guardians, that's what we call ourselves, that have become astronauts or are astronauts, and uh, anybody can become an astronaut, um, a civilian, a government employee, or or a, a military member. Um, with that said, so most of the mission is for satellites. Um, we have various different types of satellites and assets in space, uh, things that orbit the Earth, uh, as well as the, the communication systems that interface with those satellites, so the ground stations that have up and down links to those satellites. And um, at, at the root of it, the Space Force, our, our mission is to, to ensure the U.S.'s freedom uh, in space. Uh, we we have adversaries across the world, and uh, we are um, ensuring that the U.S. national security, as well as our, our military missions and other crucial uh, missions that you and I take advantage of, like uh, GPS, um, that, that, is a, that mission is assured by the U.S. Space Force. Awesome. Well, let's go ahead and bring Andrew back in, and we will have a, a conversation here between um, the two of you and myself and all of these questions that are coming back in. And Andrew, I, I wanted to bring you in because I think the next series of questions, they all kind of go together. And I'm anxious to hear how both of you respond to them. So the first question, is learning code like learning the alphabet or is it more challenging and complex? Well, I think it's always wise to have multiple Andrews answer a question. So I'll... Uh... Uh, I'll defer to my colleague from the Space Force since he's an active code practitioner. So I'd say uh, it's, a, it's a constant. So to, to be a, a coder or a software developer or any any sense of the word, um, it's a constant learning experience. You're gonna with with any skill in life, you're gonna be a beginner. You're gonna start off with easy easy um, uh, languages such as the alphabet. Um, the entry into the software to, uh, into coding is going to be um, basic and then over time you will develop those skills and uh and have a, a strong understanding over the years and learn more uh, you can specialize in specific technologies um different areas of a computer because there's many very um complex parts of a computer um how computers talk to computers um there's so many different uh routes that you can take uh with encoding um and and different levels of experience and 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 no no one person has mastered their their um their expertise there's a constant learning um going right and there are different kinds of languages for different purposes just as there are multiple tools to solve different kinds of problems sometimes you need a wrench sometimes you need a hammer you know sometimes you need a more natural language like a C or a Python. Sometimes you need a markup language like HTML, which isn't actually algorithmic, but it still modifies things. Think about learning a language as, as engaging in an act of logic and trying to decide 
which tool will provide you with the best outcome. And just as when it comes to languages we speak and write in the non-digital world, learning a foreign language can help enrich your understanding of the world and your own native language. Sometimes learning an additional language outside of your field of comfort when it comes to coding can make you a better coder in your primary language. And I think that goes into one of the next questions, and that was, what's the hardest coding language to learn? It sounds like that's on a case-by-case -case and person-by-person -person basis. All right, the next question that we've got coming in, and I, I really want to know the answer to this one. Um, and so, Major, I'm going to ask it to you first, and then, Andrew, I'm going to come back to you to get a little bit of the historical perspective on this. Have you ever coded something wrong, and what happened? <laughs> uh, I don't think any programmer has has gotten through um, their career without coding something wrong. Um, most of the time, uh, it's pretty harmless. You can um, you can you, you part of part of the coding process is is called debugging, and that's usually finding where are your errors, why is why is the computer not doing what you uh, you expect it to be doing, and it's. Um, the computer does what you tell it to do, so it's always a human error. Um, so, uh, I, I couldn't, I can't speak off experience, but maybe the the largest impact of me coding something incorrectly. But I've gone through many, many uh, hours and 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 hair pulling of figuring out what uh, what has been going wrong with my code. And Andrew, is there a historical perspective on that? Have we seen that that there have been things done wrong sure. in the past? Sure. I mean, when it comes to my own personal coding in the past, I've certainly made errors. Uh, I always, uh, it's not the hardest language, but I always find Fortran a difficult language as an optimizing compiler just because it is so tricky. A great historical example of this intersection, we use the expression computer bug and one of the very fine artifacts held by the Smithsonian Institution over at the National Museum of American History is the original computer bug. Uh, from working on the Mark II computer, they kept running into all these errors. And so they joked that there must actually be a bug in the machine. And they open it up one day and they find there actually was a moth in there. So we have that moth, the original computer bug that Admiral Grace Hopper, one of the first real computer programmers in the 1940s, pinned to a notebook. And so there's always something that will get in the way of your code. Code is as much about perseverance and ingenuity as it is about learning the ins and outs of the actual language. And we've, we've got a question that's come in. Um, Andrew, can you talk a little bit about the, the Mars orbiter and the metric versus English? Do you, or, do you know about that? I mean, I, I know a little bit about it, but I'm not terribly well versed in speaking about it. My colleague, Matthew Schindel at the Air and Space Museum handles most of the scientific mission tasks, but there, the loss of, uh, of satellites and technologies due to simple glitches and human errors of mistranslation of choosing the, the wrong system of measurement you know, has a long history uh, when we think about, you know, implications for the Challenger explosion, when we think about uh, just in general, the sense that we live in a complex world of multiple standards. And one thing that computer programmers try to do is always making sure that they are speaking the same standard with someone else when they're attempting to make something interoperable. And I've just gotten uh, a little history tidbit the navigation team at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory used the metric system of millimeters and meters in its calculation on the Mars Climate Orbiter, while yeah. Lockheed Martin used the English system, and that caused it to fail. Yes. So, Major, I've got a question to follow up with you. I assume that you are working with people that are not sitting in a cubicle next to you, that you're working with people potentially spread out all over the world. How do you handle making sure that you're all on the same page like that? Uh, yes, of course. So with the Space Force, uh, with this, as a super coder, we, we actually, um, I tune in um, to existing, we, we have a, a, in a programming cycle, you have things called sprints, and that's where uh, we get together for a length of time and, and knock out uh, different problem sets, different user stories, and um, we, we 
basically code little pieces of an application that build up to the full application. Um, and, and this is all done from, from members across the world. Um, I had a, a colleague that uh, I worked with that was in Japan and uh, I was at the time in the Netherlands, now in Colorado, also also uh, coding. And there are there are that's that's um, a cool, very cool capability of now today is of being able to to code in real time. We have communication systems to be able to, like we're doing today, um, with um, doing a face to face video. Um, but then also uh, with the IDE, which is the um, um, interface the development inter uh, environment um, we we can we can write code and 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 test that code and, and make changes and and debug like I mentioned earlier all all together um, in a collaboration effort um, and that's a pretty cool um, capability of, of today's modern day programming all right so another question is coming and keep those questions coming we've still got some time um, and we've got some really great questions coming in. Um, and this goes to both of you. What's your favorite part of coding? And do you have a favorite project that either you were involved with or that you've learned about? Um, and you look like you're thinking about that. Maybe we can start with major. Yeah, so for me, uh, with coding, I love seeing the end result. So what, like I just mentioned with the stories, a lot of time you'll start off with, with a problem. You're like, man, I have no idea how to do this. And then you, you, you've you gone through similar uh, challenges previously through your experience of programming and coding, but you haven't faced that exact challenge. And it's, it's, uh, it's the critical thinking and problem solving that's um, really rewarding. And then, of course, uh, being able to see that tangible end result. Uh, if, I mean, no application really ends. There's, a, there's always a, um, a continuous improvement in application development, but... Um, having a product that you've been working on for a long time, um, whether it's, you know, individually or with, with, um, with other people, uh, it's really rewarding to kind of see the fruits of your labor. Andrew, how about you? Well, I'm always interested in the attempt to turn the complexity and contingency of the real world into a relatively elegant set of mathematical interrelations, which is what coding ultimately is. My favorite example of a project where coding is involved is a great representation of the ways in which the long history of computing still continues to shape the world we live in today. Almost every program that exists today, whether you're playing a game, you're doing a virtual reality simulation, or you're attempting to do some sort of scientific process that involves random number generation, descends from what was called the Monte Carlo method, an algorithm developed in the 1940s on the ENIAC, which was one of the first electronic digital computers, and was associated with the Los Alamos labs and nuclear testing following the Manhattan Project. So in order to create a way of randomizing numbers because computers can't actually randomize. That's one of the fascinating little tidbits. We developed these elaborate uh, algorithmic processes and they are still the backbone of everything from computer gaming to VR today. So the next time you put on a headset or you log in to play a game on Steam, just consider that you are dealing with the descendant of a complex mathematical formula, an algorithm that was created to test nuclear bomb simulations. That's amazing. Um, Major, we've got a question that's come in. Uh, somebody wants to know where the term super coder comes from. I envision like you pulling open your shirt and there being a big S and a C there. Is that the way that, that it works? No, so the, the Space Force is... Uh... I, I believe motto would be the correct term is Semper Supra, which is Latin for always above. And uh, the the Supra coder, so it's uh, S U P R A uh, coder is just a play off of those words from um, from from our motto. Nice, nice. All right, um, lots more questions coming in, uh, Major. Somebody asked if you wouldn't mind sharing. Um, which gamified code coding apps your daughters use? Of course. Um, 
uh, they are on a app called Codable, and it's it's more or less uh, it's really I, I I believe it progresses over ages. But my my youngest started when she was three years old with it, um, and she's now five, still still playing with it. Um, it teaches you very fundamental. It's it's a game, but it um, it's fun. Uh, but it teaches you the very fundamentals of programming. So um, logic, so like programming sequences, as well as uh, like some some more advanced things like loops or conditional statements and stuff like that. That's awesome. And Andrew, you had mentioned this earlier, and I, I want to come back to it, and, and maybe you can both weigh in on this. It feels like coding is everywhere, but can you all kind of put a point on that? Like, where where is coding that I'm not thinking of it or that a student is using it every day, but they're not thinking of it? Andrew, can you start with that? Well, we live in a world awash with algorithms. So uh, from the moment when you wake up in the morning um, to the alarm on your phone to when you uh, go to bed at night, if you're whether you're going to work, you're going to school, you're going out and having fun, the things that shape your life today are often guided by these hidden algorithmic and so a lot of people are doing holiday shopping now, and they're getting recommendations from elaborate code-based systems of what to buy. They turn on a, a music playlist or open up something like YouTube to watch videos, the things that are recommended to them. Uh, there are a lot of really impressive algorithms in the world that do a lot of high-level things. But an example of an algorithm that I encounter nearly every week is when I go to CVS and I buy something at the drugstore and it prints out this giant receipt of coupons and that are generated by an algorithm based on my past purchases, where I'm buying, and the shopping patterns of what they need to get off the shelf. So that's an example of an algorithm at work. My, my phone is sitting here right next to us, and I assume that later tonight I will start hitting ads for coding games and, and things like that for, for my kids. Um, Major, how about you? Where are some places where a student might not think they're using code, but they are? So I would say nowadays, just it, it's it's probably harder to find examples of where you're, where there's not coding than and then when there is, uh, just to play off the example that Andrew gave. So not only is there coding for for the receipt like for the systems themselves but it's it's the there's a whole bunch of back-end things that you're not thinking of like the timing which is coming across satellites we're using gps for timing uh the transactions between uh the 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 cashier as well as back on back to the bank to ensure that you have the money and then the trusted agent between the bank there's so many different interconnected systems there there's various levels of coding applied to make those those uh, communications work together, um, and it, it's much more than what you can see. It's the interaction across across uh, electronic systems. And if I could uh, add on what Andrew was saying, we're at this remarkable moment where we sort of pivoted to an earlier hiddenness of computing. The age of mainframe computing was about giant computers in the 60s and 70s that took room-sized apparatuses of air conditioning and wiring to keep them running and teams of operators. Then we have an age of personal computing where computers end up on desktops and in dorm rooms and on kitchen uh, tables. And then we have an age of mobile computing where people carry computers around with them. Yet a huge amount of that calculating power is actually done in the cloud. And the cloud is remote. The cloud is a return to that kind of deep seated centralized computing out of sight in data centers. The servers that run our modern society are in a way a uh, resurgence of a certain kind of mainframe centralized computing. And those are very present in what we do, but they are not present in how we encounter them in our daily lives. We've got another question. This one from Miss Spencer's class at Cedar Lane Elementary. Thank you all so much for tuning in today. Um, and so Major, they wanna know what coding languages are you using? Uh, so I've used several across my time. So as a super coder and like uh, with current development, it's mostly web development. So that's about 95% JavaScript. So interfacing with it, almost an abstraction of using JavaScript uh, and TypeScript, which is just a strictly typed version of JavaScript. Um, um, mostly JavaScript, but in my time of application development uh, through education and other programs, I've used C++, I've used C, I've 
coded in Objective C before Swift on on Apple uh, systems and um, man uh, Java as well as this you'll come so the language itself um, it's more important to learn concepts and and um, really the the appropriate ways of of, of coding um, and and sort of the logic as Andrew has explained. Um, and because languages work differently, but when it comes to it, most of it is um, mathematical thinking and language is just it's just an application of that logic, uh, just like learning you're, you're communicating with the computer in a different way, just like uh, with natural languages. Andrew, how many coding languages are there and do coding languages go extinct? Yes, there are thousands of coding languages because there are subsets of languages, just as there are subsets of human spoken languages and that form dialects. So uh, if you think about Java uh, and all of the different offshoots of that and how that functions for particular purposes, specific communities develop those. So there, there are tens of thousands of languages, but a few predominate, there are probably 15 or so that are most commonly used, but then they fall in and out of favor. So there are languages like COBOL, for instance, that form basis, the bases of other subsequent languages, but still exist on some archaic mainframes run by the federal government. So you have to have someone who knows how to use it. Uh, other languages fade in and out of popularity as they are superseded by new generations or languages that are better suited for the turn. So if you had asked a developer in the 1990s, uh, you know, what they would have thought would be essential to a language and say C++, then you're going to get something very different than what a mobile developer creating apps for a particular environment in the 2020s is going to say. All right, Major, this is a question that I asked to someone that codes on the Green Bank Observatory Telescope, and I, I'm, I'm anxious to hear if you have a similar answer. Do y'all ever hide like little like Hey, this was Major Garaspo that coded this in the coding language, or is that is that not a thing at the military? Um, I mean, so you kind of can't get away with it nowadays because uh, when you code in a collaborative environment, like I was speaking to earlier, uh, there's record of who does what. So when you code something within the within, within the application. Uh, lines of code that are modified will not only say who edited this, but when they did that. Um, but in regards to the fun piece that you're speaking of, um, people have, um, there's, there's multiple ways to use, just like in English, we, we can say things, the same thing, different ways that that's also true, uh, and, and, and programming languages, you can, you can accomplish things in different ways and people have different styles. And once you get to know your, your teammates, you can kind of know who did what styles, but of, then of course you can also add comments in, uh, which is just, uh regular nat natural language. We use comments all the time across code to, to let other programmers who are picking up the code and never seen it before, uh, what, what, what were you doing and why did you do it this way? And uh, what's the intent of what you're trying to accomplish with the, the code? Cool, so not too many Easter eggs hidden in there. <laughs> that, that probably depends on the developer. There you go. All right, uh, do you all have a favorite video game and have you ever developed parts of one and then so that was a question that came in. And then I have a question that goes with that. So when I watch programming, because I work on lectures and things like this, I, I can think about like what's going on in the background. Does that happen to you all when you're playing a video game? Major, we'll start with you. So it's, uh, it's a bit funny that you would mention this because uh, you guys probably all have gathered by now. I'm a little bit of a nerd. So um, I actually play on an esports team for the Space Force, which is uh, for the Rocket League. Uh, I don't know if you have heard of that game, but uh, it's basically three v three car soccer. You're a, you're an RC car. You're flying around and you're scoring goals, and it's soccer. Um, when I play, um, I I haven't myself actually dabbled in in uh, app game application developments so like Unity or Unreal Engine, those types of languages, but uh, I do see interfaces on top of the game where uh, I can kind of gather um, what is happening in, in the background with the code. Andrew, how about you? Well, I came of age playing computer games in the 90s and uh, 
learn programming through very simple text-based uh, games and simulations. Uh, one of my favorite games of, of all time was SimCity, and I used to play different iterations of that. And you look at the way the code is structured and how that code actually became embedded in the development of urban planners in subsequent years after the games came out. So there's something very interesting about how the ways in which games are encoded in which they present uh, themselves. And I will make a plug for the fact that there are a number of curators and historians at the Smithsonian who are interested in video games and computer games, and we collect them. So just keep that in mind. If you have any space games you want to send the Smithsonian, we'll, we'll happily take them. But the, the, the way that games function uh, through a ludology of encouraging us to approach things in particular ways trains us to do things. And so generations that have grown up as gamers now for about three generations see the world differently than those who did not experience games as children or who do not play games. And that's fascinating. The same way that the world was suddenly very different after the development of the phonograph and the radio meant you could hear things and record things that couldn't be done before. In a world where there are games, now that everyone has exposure to games and many people identify as gamers, the way they perceive the world fundamentally changes as a result of their enjoyable experiences playing games. All right, so we're just about out of time. This has been an incredibly cool discussion and, and I'm, I'm getting in my chat from the background like, who knew that Space Force, Space Force had an eSports team? We're, we're all kind of nerding out about that back here as well. Um, so this is kind of a twofold question and I, and I wanna get both of your takes on it. What careers are available in the coding field today that the audience might not think about, particularly you know kids that are, are growing up with this? And then what are those skills that somebody that's interested in this needs to start looking at and, and thinking about as they, they want to pursue this as a career. Uh, Major, let's start with you. So like I mentioned before, I think that the most important thing you can do is have a desire to learn um, and, and always trying to, to improve your understanding of things that you don't understand. Um, that, that will set, set you up for a, a successful mentality with becoming a programmer. In regards to specifically for coding, um, having a strong mathematical background um, is is for sure um, a, it's it's a must because when it comes to it, length. I mean, even with just language, I mean, English itself, um, it's it's logic. Um, it's not just math in the sense of numbers that you think about because computers do do numbers, but it's also uh, ordering and sequence and thinking about um, solving problems. Um, um, logically. Um, yeah, and I think building on what the major said, though computing, coding, software are rooted in mathematics, they are mathematical processes that are being embedded within human systems. Before I came to the Smithsonian, I worked at Carnegie Mellon University uh, as a faculty member. And that's a place that's particularly known for its research into human computer interactions. I would argue two areas where there's a great deal of exploration yet to be done and where there is a great place for people to make a space for themselves are in the areas of user interface and the ways in which people interact with software. Because you can design the most perfect code, but it may run headlong into the messy reality that is human society. Uh, there's a great deal of travail in the news right now about the largest social media platform, uh, Twitter, and sort of what's happening with its code. That's a very human conundrum of how do you deal with people. You can program the tools the right way, but you need to make those tools slot in a fashion that makes sense for how they will be used. That's outstanding. And this has been a, a great discussion today. I do want to encourage everybody that if you want to explore some different careers, including um, coding, be sure to check out the May episode of STEM in 30. We go to Green Bank Observatory in West Virginia, giant radio telescope, scariest thing I've ever done going to the top of that. But we talk to everybody from the maintenance folks to the software engineers. So I encourage you to check that out. Um, 
Major and Andrew, thank you both so much for the conversation today. I do want to bring in Kelsey Vollmer, who's going to share some additional resources with you, and then we'll wrap up the show. Kelsey, are you there? All right, I am here. Let me bring some stuff up. Oh my goodness, this was such a neat and interesting conversation. Uh, both Andrews, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, I did want to share a little bit about resources for classrooms where you all can um, find some more information about coding and the Apollo 17 mission. Some of you might know this week actually is the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 17 mission, which was the final mission um, to the moon that we did. And now with Artemis being right in our news this um, uh, this month, this past month, I guess, November, December, um, you know, it seems like such an interesting connection that it's been 50 years since we've been there and now we're sending people back. Uh, so if you want to talk to your students about that really, that beginning coding, that core rope coding, uh, we have some fascinating resources from the National Air and Space Museum, including an activity where students code with beads and uh, pipe cleaners and string their initials um, and learn about how our LOLs, as Andrew taught me, um, <laughs> coded all of those programs into the memory for the Apollo missions. Um, several of you are going to be very familiar with the Hour of Code website. This is a great place to get some resources for your classroom. And Tinker.com, spelled with a Y, actually right now did a partnership with NASA and has several return to the moon programs uh, ranging from kindergarten all the way up to 12th grade. So that is a great resource as well. Um, and if you're interested in learning more about those Apollo missions and Saturn V rocketry and how computers were used in those, uh, that we have several videos right there including kind of the most basic with that SciShow kids talking about how they knitted through all of those little bits uh, to get to the moon. And then it kind of goes up in uh, level from there. So the Ted Ed one talking about Margaret Hamilton and all of the programming that she did and how that program actually worked and split up the hardware versus the software. Um, and then how did NASA steer the Saturn V actually looks um, in detail with an engineer who worked on those and talks about um, setting up all the code and having the double and triple systems and all of that stuff. So that would, I would say, is more a little bit for high schoolers or beyond. Um, but all of those resources are there. I put them in the chat. Um, and so you can find those resources in the slideshow for today. And then we also have several other resources that were put into the Coding Apollo and today um, picture there. So that's what I have. I will, since we have a couple minutes, I will also make a plug for um, the Teacher Innovator Institute. If you are a teacher, the National Air and Space Museum has a wonderful, wonderful um, teacher professional development where STEM teachers are brought to Washington, D.C. for two weeks uh, in July. And it's a two-year program and it is completely paid for by the museum. So those applications are open now. That is also in the um, document. So feel free to check that out. And I know Marty would love to kind of wrap us up. And Marty, when does that uh, STEM in 30 episode come out? Assuming everything goes as planned, that will be Thursday. Um, I've seen the almost final draft of it. It's looking really good. We look at the new um, Destination Moon Gallery at the National Air and Space Museum, which is amazing. So you get to kind of go on the inside of there. And then we also talked to Victor Glover, one of the Artemis astronauts, about taking care of yourself and taking care of your crewmates. So it's kind of a fun look at Apollo through Artemis. Um, Andrew, uh, Major, thank you both so much. Really great conversation today. And to all of you that submitted questions and tuned in, outstanding questions, really good stuff. And we can't wait until you all are working with us at the National Air and Space Museum or Coding for Space Force. Have a great rest of your day.